Hey, what's up, everyone, and welcome to week four. I should add some fire to like my hands or something. But this is week four of the What's Your Why series. And yes, I'm still in the closet. <laughs> but today's episode features me and it features a conversation between me and one of my good friends, um, Pastor. Or yeah, he is a pastor. Pastor Robbie Lasher, who is the apologetics and adult ministry pastor at Desert Springs Community Church out in Goodyear, Arizona. I've never been to Arizona. Um, maybe you have. But man, when I when I put the, the initial post out there that I wanted to, you know, interview some pastors, I did not think that pastors from all over the place was gonna, you know, comment and hop in and be like, hey, I would love to be a part. But um, Pastor uh, Lashua was one of the first guys that actually reached out to me and said, hey, I would love to be on your podcast. I would love to be a part of your show. Um, you know, whatever you need, just let me know. And man, he has been a blessing to me indeed. His He has a podcast as well. It's called Christ Culture and Coffee. Um, so if you're listening to us, um, by the way, of Christ, um, Christ Culture and Coffee podcast, um, shout out to you guys. I love what you guys are doing. I love what the, um, the podcast is all about. I love the little golden nuggets that you give about coffee and everything like that. And as you see in this conversation, man, we have a great time just talking about, you know, what our why, what is our purpose. And we have a great time just getting to know one another. And so you'll see a lot of, um, our, of our conversation. You'll hear his heart. And I'm praying that you'll be inspired by this guy, man. He is very, he's a very inspirational guy. He has a great ministry, a great calling on his life. Uh, and I just pray that you guys are blessed uh, tremendously by the conversation. So I'm not going to keep going on and on because this action, this, this, this series is actually longer than an hour. And I want you guys to get all of it because it's all good. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, enjoy the conversation between me and Pastor Lashua here on One Faith Radio. Yeah, so I'm Robbie Lashua. I'm a pastor of apologetics and adult uh, ministries at Desert Springs Community Church in uh, Goodyear, Arizona, which is, it's like a suburb on the west side of Phoenix, Arizona. Um, I've been at the church now, what year is it? 2020. So I've been at the church over eight years now. Uh, and I was a youth pastor for 10 years previously to, to moving into this position of being the apologetics pastor. Uh, and so as part of what I do at the church is uh, I'm an associate. So I preach probably once every couple of months from the main stage. I have classes I teach every week. I'm in charge of all adult education at the church and mercy care ministries. Uh, and then I run a weekly podcast like what you're doing. Uh, that's on apologetics called Christ Culture and Coffee. And so those are the major things that that I do uh, at the church uh, here in, in Goodyear. That's awesome. Yeah. So um, can you expound a little bit on your podcast, Christ Culture and Coffee? That sounds very, very yeah. interesting. So I love coffee, number one, which is great. I love Jesus yeah. more, though. So we put it in order of importance, right? It's Christ right. first, then culture, then coffee. Right. <laughs> um, but uh, I wanted to make a podcast because I, I'm like a hyper nerd man like I love school and I love reading and so I went to seminary and I studied biblical languages and then after that I went and got a master's in apologetics out in California at Biola University and um, I just really believe that Christians need to know why they believe what they believe uh, especially in our culture you know where it's, it's relativistic and, and postmodern and we have to be able to defend our faith Right. And so um, I want to make this podcast as a, a weekly installment of here's why you should believe in Christianity. And if you are a Christian, here are the reasons that we have for believing in it and uh, how we can go out into our culture and help people understand that Christianity is true for all people, for all time and all places. Uh, and so that's what it's about. So we, we talk about uh, the coffee aspect is every episode for the first couple of minutes, we give some kind of coffee tip. Right. you know, on how there's, there's uh, how much caffeine is in coffee or what kind of roasts are good or what kind of drinks. And it's just, you know, different stuff like that. Cause it's fun. We obviously drink coffee while we do the show. Right. Um, <clears throat> but then we get into the apologetics issues. So we've done shows on, you know, uh, why Jesus rose from the dead and it's a fact of history. Uh, we're currently, our series is on the reliability of the new Testament We've done a lot of stuff on, you know, postmodernism. We've done stuff on nihilism, Mormonism, uh, Islam, a whole bunch of stuff. So 
it's basically on, yeah, why we believe what we believe and how we can know uh, that it's true through evidence and reason. So it's really fun. I co-host it with uh, my friend Tyler. He was actually a student of mine that was in my youth ministry for four years. Awesome. Uh, now he's a, a graduate at Grand Canyon University and he's married. So he's an adult now, I guess. Uh, <laughs> so we, uh, yeah, we co-host it together. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So apologetics, that's one of my favorite topics because um, there are so many um, great apologists that I mm. fell in love with over the years. Um, of course, Robert Zacharias, everyone loves Robert. Yeah, of course, and yeah. R.I.P. to him. Um, and also, one of his understudies on the Bill uh, Koreshi, I love yeah. him. I thought that his testimony um, prior to his passing, um, and God rest his soul as well, um, yeah. his testimony coming from being a Muslim to being a Christian um, and then just dealing with that aspect on the apologetics tip. I, it's, a, it's phenomenal. I, I love his book, <laughs> Seek, uh, what is it, Finding Allah, Seeking, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. Yep. And it's just so, it was so profound just to hear his story and just to read his story, just to see the, what he went through, um, the journey from Islam to Christianity. I think that, I mean, to, for anyone to, to, to come to Christ in any way, I think that it is definitely um, a great journey because there's so much that we have to go through on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, yeah, one of the things I liked about Nabil, so Nabil was one of my professors actually at Biola. Really? Um, yeah, one of the things that I thought was really rad about him was how like he actually had to give up something in mm. order to follow Jesus. Like for me, I've never had to like really give up anything that great. But man, with his whole family being, you know, strict Muslims um, and, and giving up the family and having their, uh, you know, anger and upset at him and still following Jesus through that, man, that really made an impact on me on what am I willing to give up, you know, and, and if Christianity isn't easy for me, yeah. will I follow it, you know, or, yeah. or will I just, am I doing it because it's, because it's not hard here. And I hope, I hope that's not the case, obviously, but right. it just really made me kind of, it sobered me up to think about that aspect of following the Lord and what Jesus says, right? Counting the cost. Yeah. And I think, I think that here in America, American Christianity, we're, we're spoiled. We're very mm -hmm. spoiled to um, how we came to Christ because I mean, now we have some people that have came, you know, a hard road. Maybe people were ex um, gang members or yeah, yeah. were maybe ex Satanists or different things like that. But, you know, I think for someone to grow up in another religion, um, and totally abandon that whole aspect of their religion, of their upbringing, of their family. It's like, you know, hey, your family is like, you're turning your back on us. But in, in and of itself, it's like, no, I'm not. I, you know, I'm really seeking Jesus. And I think one of, the, one of the stories that he told that literally brought a tear to my eye was when he was talking about when he got married and how his parents wasn't at the wedding and how he didn't get the chance to, um, to dance with his mom at the wedding. And how it brought a tear to his heart and how, how it hurt him. But in that moment, he thought about, you know, the sacrifices, as you said, the sacrifices that he made to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. And I wholeheartedly believe, and I, I'm, <laughs> I wholeheartedly believe that he's up in heaven. Um, he's rejoicing along, along with the angels. And I think that, you know, he, he left such a profound impact on this, on this world that, Anyone that, that literally reads or listens to his story will be impacted in any kind of way. Oh, because, yeah. Like I said, we, we've been spoiled, but when you go to other countries and you go to other um, places and, and you really study their religions and study their faith and to see how some of those people may come to Christianity or see how some of those people um, maybe have gone through uh, great limbs just to remain being a Christian. You mm -hmm. know, it's very, um, I applaud those people. Um, yeah. I, I don't even, I don't even want to say that I envy them. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't, I don't want to say that either. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> because they could, I mean, I'm not saying they can have that, but it's like, you know, hey, it just shows just how gracious God has been to us as a country um, mm -hmm. and everything that we're going through in this current uh, season with the um, pandemic and the racist, uh, racism issues, uh, everything that's kind of coming to uh, a head as of late, you know, I feel like that doesn't even compare to half of the stuff that these people are going through in other countries. Oh, yeah. uh, one country that comes to my mind um, is Africa and how, uh, is it Boko Haram, how they're going around pretty much persecuting Christians um, mm. for no reason. Um, and that's just one of the, the many um, radical Muslim um, extremes that are out there. Yeah. It's really killing Christians for just saying, hey, I love Jesus. 
And yeah. I feel like, yeah, I don't really live in a fear of that, you know, going to church on Sunday, being yeah. afraid that people are going to come in and kill me because right. I'm a Christian. But that is a reality for a lot of our brothers and sisters around the world. In Africa, like you said, also in India, you know, there's, yeah. it's kind of crazy, but there's this huge militant Hinduism that's mm-hmm. happening right now. And they're, they're putting pastors in cars with their kids, lighting it on fire, mm-hmm. killing Christians in the name of Hinduism. Jesus. Um, and so I don't, I don't live in daily fear of that. Um, but I also know that, you know, those people who go through that, like the Bible talks about, are going to be rewarded mm-hmm. for their for their loyalty and their faithfulness to serve the Lord, no matter where it leads. And that honestly, like, I don't want to have to go through that, but it encourages me that God is going to acknowledge their sacrifice one day. Exactly. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that he's a God who's not just just, but he's also fair. Exactly. And it seems like people who go through that, they should get rewarded a little differently than the rest of us. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Cause we just struggling, you know, paycheck to paycheck, you know, Hey, yep. little things like that, you know, <laughs> was this bill going to get paid or not? But there's people that's literally, you know, sacrificing their entire livelihood just to be. Yeah. I remember reading um, a Facebook post of a young lady um, a while back, almost some years ago, and she was in India. Um, and she was talking about how in the middle of the night, it would be like maybe two o'clock in the morning, her and some friends would just, you know, get up early in the morning, that type of, you know, that type of dedication to faith, first of all, it's just mm-hmm. profound. But they would get up at two, three o'clock in the morning, go all the way out deep in the woods just to worship Jesus. Yeah. Um, just to worship loudly as they want to, because if they were to do it within their city limits, they would be persecuted. And wow. so I think that when you when you look at things like that, and you look at you know where we are as a country and where we are right now, you know we can't compare to that. No, <laughs> you know, no, not we, at all. We, we can't compare to that at all. I mean, we have racism and, and people that are just you know downright has the devil in it. But yeah. you know we have to, we we can navigate through that a lot more easily than people in those other countries who are really struggling and doing different things that you know to us we not we're not really thinking about that you know all mm-hmm. all it takes for us is just hey we can roll over say a quick prayer and do whatever we can in our household we can go around blast music worship and yeah. all that stuff and don't have to be worried about anyone or anything yeah. or you know we can just go to church on Sunday and just yeah worship. people are saying that. To you know, lately I've been hearing a lot of uh, oh, having to wear a mask at church is religious persecution. <laughs> I don't think so. Like, I don't yeah, think I don't. So. I don't think that's true. That's like a stretch, and I, I don't yeah, think it is a bit, bit because yeah. it's like you know I've heard a lot of people talk about how it's religious persecution and it's a it's a sign of the times and it's and it's preparing us or easing us up for the uh, market of beast. And I'm like, you know, I I'm 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 a pretty smart guy. You know, I. Mm-hmm. I have a master's in information systems and, um, and technology management from Liberty University, mm-hmm. um, but I, I don't. I, I know the Bible. You know, I'm, I'm licensed ordained. I know the Bible. I, I read it. I studied it for years. It's nowhere in there that the the mark of the beast is going to be us wearing a mask. No. <laughs> the, the crazy thing is, okay, and I don't know, you know, where you land on your eschatology. But like I'm a pre-tribulational rapture guy. Mm-hmm. And so I don't even think we'll be here when the mark of the beast thing happens. Mm-hmm. But even if we are, don't you think God would let us know what it is? Like, so you have to think if it's masks, he's tricking most Christians to follow it. I don't know if that's something that God <laughs> would do. It seems like he wants us to know about it. So. Exactly. I mean, he's a God, he's a God who will tell us up front, whether it's through his Holy Spirit or whether it's through yeah. some, mer- some uh, messenger that will just preach the gospel truthfully and tell us, hey, this is what's going to happen to prophet or something like that. But, you know, yeah. for us, you know, I think that we're just so, I think a lot of people are just mm-hmm. been cooped up in the house too long and just tired of being in the That's house. That's the truth, bro. Crazy and just <laughs> yep. That's the truth. <laughs> differently and it's just not, it's just not coming out right. I think but, sometimes too, Christians like, and I'm a Christian, but <clears throat> I think sometimes they just want to be that last generation and that end times generation i think all along people have wanted that because it's cool right like that would be great to be in the end times um but i always ask myself what if i'm not in the end times right like what if i'm just a regular dude who is has to live out christianity with weird stuff happening like pandemics and racial tension and postmodernism. like what if i'm not that significant right, right. Uh, can i be faithful in just kind of a mundane existence Uh, Because I think that's harder than being like the sensational last generation of, you know, end time stuff. 
I mean, I don't know. I want to be faithful with wherever I'm at, but I also need to be okay with where God has me too. But I think sometimes people just want to be significant. And so they make up these, you know, this guy's the antichrist, that guy's the antichrist. This is the mark of the beast. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. eh, maybe, but either way, we got to be faithful, right? Right. Either way, we got to be faithful because I mean, at the end of the day, we all have to die sometime soon. And yep. whether, how we die, I don't know. Only God knows, but as long as we have our lives in check, have everything in order, you know, we have a sure ticket into heaven. That's, That's right. all that matters. Um, and it's just funny that you say that because it's just, it's, I've seen <laughs> so much and I've heard so much on TikTok and Facebook, people just putting videos and stuff out there. And I'm like, you know, it's, it's great that people are studying and people are reading, but you know, it's also, it's people need to read to get an understanding. Um, yeah. That's that, you know, we need to read to get an understanding, not read to just scare people. <laughs> yeah that's right yeah. yeah and the bible shouldn't scare us i don't know like it should. i don't think end time stuff should scare us i'm pretty sure at the beginning of the revelation uh jesus says that whoever reads the book and understands it will be blessed not yeah. scared yeah so i don't I, know i remember the first time i read oh, I'm just thinking about this part. yeah <laughs> i remember the first time i read um the book of revelation and it was just leading up to it because you know how as a kid you know you, you hear about it and it's like oh my gosh it's just so terrifying but the first time i read it i was like this book is really not that scary it's, no. <laughs> it's not that bad it's just it's just a prophecy of what's to come and it's just a mm -hmm. prophecy of you know things that are going to happen um and i think that a lot of christians if we really truly are excited about heaven excited about going to heaven or excited about anything dealing with god the book of revelation should not scare us at all that's right um, yeah i agree just, if anything as you said it should make us excited it should get us excited even more excited about um, jesus returning um, yep. about being more faithful to him being excited about the opportunity to actually go to heaven i mean the bible says um what is the straight, straightest um, gate and narrowest the way um and only few will make it in and in order for it to be accounted for one of the few you know you have to you know live and um and believe the Bible in its um, entirety. So, mm. all right. So this is a good conversation so far. I'm really enjoying it. Good, me too. I man. love, yeah, I love uh, Escalade. Oh, I can't even talk. I, I get tongue tied. When I get excited, <laughs> <laughs> I get tongue tied I and start stuttering. Yeah. <laughs> but I love, you know, talking about eschatological events and things like that, um, especially in the Bible, because, you know, we tend to gloss over it. Um, yeah. I remember like a while ago, like preachers used to, preach about heaven a lot and now we're not we're not talking about it too much more nowadays we're talking more about you know things that are concerning the times which is you know great because people are really people really truly need to hear that you know they need to hear mm -hmm. what's going on now but i think that we should always stay focused on heaven stay focused yeah. on the end goal which is going to heaven the eternal yeah. goal um and it should be preached more and it should be taught more uh, so that people can better understand because I, <laughs> I saw this TikTok video the guy was basically um, saying how the Catholic Church is the, um, the Antichrist and the Pope is the Antichrist and, and it was just going down a list of things and it's very intriguing but at the same time it's like you know if you are a, a, a young convert uh, someone who is um, out, uh, probably immature in thinking it, it would be it would twist your mind some when mm -hmm. you hear stuff like that because you're like oh maybe and he's just going through the motions and, and different things like that but you know you really have to dig deep into the bible um yeah. get an understanding first of all get an education yeah. <laughs> education is important and you know yeah, there's so. preachers who um who have an education and can give you the truth and gospel um so i i can keep going on that soapbox forever <laughs> <laughs> i'm not gonna get to any of the questions <laughs> all right so um yeah, I love your spirit, man. I really do. So what, um, we, we're just going to jump right into it. So what is your why? Um, and I will follow that question with what is your testimony for salvation? Um, mm -hmm. Mainly because, you know, of course, a lot of people's why it comes out of their testimony uh, yeah. whether for salvation or is anything else. Um, as you were saying earlier, you, know, <clears throat> you were a youth pastor and you went to school because you wanted to, you know, you know teach people the right way. And so what's your, um, what's your why? I'll stop talking. <laughs> yeah. So I think like the reason I do what I do is two, two reasons. It, it's because I love people and I want people to know what's true. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't want them just to believe in a fairy tale. I want them to know why Christianity is true, right? Mm-hmm. And it shouldn't just be something we believe in because our grandma taught it to us or we heard a convincing public speaker. We should believe in it because it's real. Um, you know how like people always say like, uh, well, Christianity just didn't really work for me. I've heard people say that. Heard and that. I always think like, what does that even mean? Like <laughs> it didn't work for you. And And the truth of it is, man, I'm not a Christian because it works for me. I'm a Christian because it's real. Right. I'm a Christian because it's true. Like living a non-Christian life is actually a lot easier, isn't it? it than is. living for Jesus is not. It's not because it's easy and it's just all fun. Um, but if if it's real that this guy rose from the dead two thousand years ago, that really has some say on how I should live my life. Exactly. Uh, if there's a guy who came back from the dead. I probably should listen to what he says because it seems like there's some kind of credibility there that other people don't have. You know, Muhammad, he didn't come back from the dead and tell us anything. Buddha didn't come back from the dead and tell us anything. Joseph Smith didn't come back from the dead. Jesus whole claim. I mean, you remember when the Pharisees were asking him for a sign, he said, I'm not giving you a sign except one, the sign of Jonah, which is what the resurrection. I'm going to be buried for three days and then I'm coming back. So everything is based on the resurrection of Jesus. And so my why is I want people to know that there's a guy who rose from the dead 2000 years ago. And if that's true, that he actually rose from the dead, then Christianity follows. Because if a guy who rose from the dead, if if Jesus actually rose from the dead, then the Bible's legitimate Mm -hmm. because he said it is right. right? If a guy rose from, if, if he actually rose from the dead, the morality taught in the Bible is legitimate. Right. If he rose from the dead, the exclusivity he taught in the Bible is true, that he is the only way and truth in life. And no one can come to the Father except through him. So I want people to investigate the resurrection. And, and that's one of my whys, man, is like I really want people to look at the claims of Jesus. And then based on whether or not he rose from the dead, accept those claims or reject them. Because right. if he didn't rise from the dead, Christianity is a complete failure. Yep. Right, everything hangs on that. Everything so, on my that. why is I want people to know that Jesus rose from the dead. And so, my testimony uh, I grew up uh, in a small, uh, rural I mean, really small rural town in northern Arizona called Pine, Arizona. You've never heard of it, I've never heard uh, of it. <laughs> yeah, of course, you haven't because there's, there's only 3,000 people who live there. Wow. It's in the hills. I don't know how much you know about Arizona, but obviously down where I live in, in Phoenix, it's desert, right? Yeah. But northern Arizona is all forest. It snows and there's lakes and it's beautiful. Right. And so I grew up in the hills in the forest uh, in a small, small town. And uh, my grandpa was a pastor out there. Uh, northern Arizona, too, was founded by Mormons. Mm. Um, Brigham Young actually sent Mormons south from Salt Lake City and north from Salt Lake City because he was trying to make a wall to keep um, uh, America out. Cause at the time it was still Mexico. It wasn't America yet. Hmm. And so Northern Arizona was founded by all those Mormons. Brigham Young sent South uh, to kind of form a wall to keep out the U S. Wow. Um, so, so there's a Mormon ward, you know, in my little small town, it was founded by Mormons. My grandpa was a Baptist pastor up there and I grew up going to church and my parents taught me about the Lord and uh, when I was four and a half, it was the summer of 1988, I was at vacation Bible school. Mm-hmm. And I remember the pastor was talking about uh, the gospel and I'd heard it before and I'd understand sin and that I was a mess because I did bad things even as a kid. And so he, he made the offer of who, who wants to believe this. And I raised my hand and he took me and some of the other kids to the back and talked it over with us again. And um, man, I really understood what I was doing. I was like, yeah believe in what Jesus did because he can save you from your sins. And so I trusted in the Lord that day. I got baptized, uh, I don't know, a few months later by my grandpa and the church that he built up there. And so um, my testimony is it's, I always thought as a kid, it was boring. You know, I'd hear other people say like, Oh, I was a crack addict and God saved me from it. Or I was a prostitute. And I always thought, man, why can't I have a testimony like that? Mine's boring. Like I grew up in a Christian home and I believed in Jesus. Right. Um, but I heard a guy one time say, Ravi, do you know how much God has saved you from, Mm. right? You were saved from all of this horrible stuff. You were saved from having a really difficult life that does have consequences, even if you become a Christian. And um, so I'm really thankful for that. I'm really thankful for what God saved me from. 
Uh, I grew up uh, going to church and going to youth group and going to Awana, and I really liked it. And I was a good kid through high school. Not obviously not perfect. Most of the sinning I've done in my life has been as a Christian, right? Since I got <laughs> saved when I was four. Right. Uh, but um, I really loved the Lord from an early age, and I always wanted to tell people about Him. And so uh, I think with that, God just He pushed me to go to a Christian school when I when I graduated high school. So I went to Southwestern Bible College here in Phoenix, mm. and um, through that, just directed me into youth ministry. I never wanted to do youth ministry. I thought it was a horrible idea. Uh, and then I graduated, and that was what my degree was in. And God's like, you're going to do this. And so for 10 years, yeah, I did youth ministry and discipling kids and teaching them who Jesus was. And obviously, high school students have tons of questions on why is this true? Why should I believe it? They have atheist friends. They have, you know, agnostic friends. And so I got to talk through a lot of those things with them and even take them on. Um, one of the things that I love doing is we'd go on mission trips, but we do apologetics mission trips. So like we trained them in Mormonism for six months and then we went to Salt Lake city and went to temple square and interviewed Mormon missionaries and evangelized to Mormons. And right. we did a, we did a atheist one year. We studied atheism for six months. Then we went to Cal state Berkeley and we got atheist professors to come in and tell our kids why Christianity was, was wrong and dumb. And they could talk with these professors and talk with students. It was awesome. Yeah. And so I always, I always think that truth will win out. And if we have the truth in Christianity, which I think we do, uh, we don't have to be afraid of anything or anybody's objections. Yeah. Uh, and if we go in with gentleness and respect, like Peter tells us to, we can really make headway with people and show them that Christianity is a worldview that really people need to contend with and think yeah. through. Uh, so that's kind of my why. I want people to know why Christianity is true. And I want uh, to, to build up the church in that because for the past hundred years, we've been kind of biblically illiterate and not good at apologetics and I want to, I want to be a part of, of uh, maturing the, the Christian church in America to be better equipped to share their faith. I agree. Uh, yeah. I think that is really profound. <laughs> it's funny because your testimony sounds a lot like mine. And don't, <laughs> don't think that, you know, your, your testimony doesn't you know, matter in that because it's, it's funny because I, I was the same way. I used to think the same thing, like, hey, <laughs> uh, I grew up in a church, you know, I'm a church kid. I just played the drums, sung in the choir, did the usher board thing, and, you know, mm -hmm. was very active. Um, my mom um, integrated me and my, my sister um, into a, um, a local church, um, and they, you know, had Awana, and they had all the, the youth ministry going, and so they were going to um, they sent us up to the mountains for um, a youth retreat and, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was very eye opening. And then also coming back from that, it was like, yeah, you can go to Disney World next year. It was like, we're not even, <laughs> <laughs> y'all want to take us to Disney World. So, I mean, I, I get it. I'm, I'm right there with you because I remember mm -hmm. listening to all those testimonies. It's like, yeah, I used to be drunk out on drugs. And I just remember one night the Lord just visited me and told me to put the crack pipe down. <laughs> Yep. You know, things like that. And it's like, man, it's like, I would love to have a cool testimony like that. But yeah. one of the things I've learned is it's just like what you said, you know, you know, you don't know what God has kept you from yeah. um, and, has, and has saved you from. And I think that is profound because, you know, I can look back on all the stuff I went through when I was in college or in high school, well, end of high school to about um, my, maybe my second second semester of my freshman year of um, college, you know, I, I don't say I was wild or anything like that, but, you know, I lived, I lived a good life. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, I was one of those kids that, you know, like you, you know, you're like, my testimony is black, so I'm just going to go try to make a testimony. Yeah. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it was like, God was just like, nah, <laughs> you know, my hand is on you for a reason, you know, I'm doing yep. different things for a reason. And for me, you know, when I was in, uh, in, in high school, um, my senior year, or I would say my junior year into my senior year, um, going into college, I was a part of the campus ministry through my mm -hmm. um, my, my my church um, back home. Um, and one of my um, one of my good friends now, he's um, he's a mentor to me as well. But he was my mentor in high school, um, and he was leading the Bible studies at North, um, U, uh, UNC University of North Carolina mm -hmm. um, in Chapel Hill. And mainly because he was a football player there, he had, you know, a pretty good presence on campus. So um, he would bring me out to the, um, 
to the Bible studies at you know mm-hmm. very young age, and my eyes are open to the college life yeah. <laughs> in high school. It was like, man, I love it. And so, you know, going from that to you know going into high into college and just looking at everything that was going on at that time, like, like everything I was putting myself into <laughs> at that time, you know, I was really searching for something. But I mm-hmm. think that what eventually ended up happening was, you know, God really opened my eyes to just how good he is and mm-hmm. exactly all that he's kept me from. I've seen, you know, many of my friends, you know, die from, you know, senseless acts. Um, one of my friends, mm-hmm. he didn't die of anything senseless. It, he just died suddenly. He had an enlarged heart and just fell dead from oh, basketball. And, you know, that really changed my life. But that really pushed me into ministry. Um, and it just so happened that the day before, the day he passed was the day before we was actually going to launch our campus ministry at um, at our school at Barton College in Wilson. Oh, man. And so it was just, it was one of those things that kind of launched me into ministry because for him, at the time, I was just going to let him deal with it because he, he loved the Lord more than I did. He read his Bible every day. I wasn't reading it every day. I wasn't praying. I wasn't doing none of that. I mean, he told me he he had read his Bible from um, from cover to cover, um, and I believe it was like in six months. Um, oh, man. He was just dedicated to it, and he would just do that religiously every single year, um, yeah. read his Bible over and over like that. I was nowhere close to that. I, <laughs> the only thing I knew at the time was John 3, 16, and I held on to that. <laughs> but, you know, seeing him go through that and then when he passed, it, it kind of launched me into ministry because people looked at me, um, looked to me as, you know, the guy was like, well, hey, you were around the world a lot. You know him. Um, mm-hmm. You guys were best friends, and you guys were about to launch this ministry. And not only that, but the ministry is coming out of the church that you're, you're at. So, I mean, it really – you know, I won't say forced me, but it really put me in a position to really hunker down, read the word, um, yeah. get serious about God <clears throat> and just and just go forth. Mm-hmm. And I believe like after when I really said yes to that moment, a lot of doors just started opening up for me um, to just do a lot of different um, things. Like I, I started singing in the gospel choir there. Um, I was, you know, ministering to different kids on campus um, and they saw me in a different light. And it was just so funny because was like you know just last semester I wasn't that guy (laughs) but it was just like how God could transform things and and, and transform you and yeah and he just takes you and puts you where he wants you to be exactly and that's Mm. exactly what he did it was like he put me there for a reason and so that's really neat that's uh yeah that's that's a little bit of my story um but yeah I think that's awesome man I really do I think your story is awesome um so when you were called to ministry Mm -hmm. Um, did you answer the call right away? Um, and the premise behind that question is because, um, you know, I think I find it interesting, you know, a lot of people have their Jonah moments, um, Mm -hmm. when God tells them to do something and like, you know, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to do me. Um, Yeah. That was my story. (laughs) You know, I'm just going to do me because I don't want to do that. But, you know, I felt like God really chased me down to, um, to, to do ministry. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people don't have that luxury because they just continue to just go and do whatever they want to do. But, <clears throat> you know, God really said, hey, stop what you're doing. Focus in on this. This is what your calling is. Yeah. And so for you, you know, when you were called, you know, did you answer the call right away? And if not, you know, why did you ignore the call and what prompted you to eventually acquiesce to the call? Yeah. So. Ever since I was a little kid, like my mom would always tell me, like, I know that you're going to be in ministry and that's what, what God wants you to do. And, you know, it's like a junior high student. You're like, ah, that sounds really lame. Like, I don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the other thing is, like, from the town I was from, you know, it, again, man, it's, it's not like back in time or anything, but it's so small. Like, our, you know, our, our churches, even today, the hymnals, and they don't have PowerPoint, and it, there's 50 people there. You know, I mean, it's, it's old school real old school, yeah. small town church. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so to be a pastor was like that. Like, I don't want to be what those guys are doing. Right. Um, so I always thought that was lame, but I love Jesus. I love Jesus a lot. And so my plan for my life, and this, it sounds so stupid looking back on it, but like I loved in junior high and high school, man, I loved like, uh, like Las Vegas style magic. 
-hmm. and I like learned all this magic stuff and I was getting hired by all these entertainment companies. And even when I moved down to the Valley, there was like two companies I was working for and I was doing all these shows all the time. And I thought my plan is I'm going to love Jesus and I'm going to go to church and I'm going to serve at my church, but I'm going to become a magician I'm going to move to Las Vegas. I'll have my own show. They'll build me my own theater. And then uh, I can sleep in all day, get up, do two shows at, you know, late at night, go to the buffets. And that's my life. Sounds great. (laughs) Sounds awesome. Dude, that's what I wanted. I wanted fame and, and magic was my ticket to do it. And so that's what I was thinking about doing. Even when I moved to college, that's what I was, that was my plan. I'm, I'm going to Bible college because I love Jesus and I want to learn about the Bible, but that's it. So while I'm in college, um, I had some professors who were like, hey, why don't you, you know, do youth ministry? And I was like, I don't want to do youth ministry. That sounds stupid. Like, I'm just, I'm learning about the Bible. And they're like, listen, like, you're already a Christian ministries major. Youth ministry, it's the same thing. It's just with kids. So you might as well get a minor. And I was like, all right, that sounds fine. So <clears throat> I let them sign me up for that. Um, but dude, I didn't want to do ministry for like pretty much all of my college years. Wow. And uh at the end of it, I was getting, you know, it's, it's like spring semester, my senior year. And I started thinking, what am I going to do with my life? Yeah. Like, wh- what do I do now? Like, I have to get a real job. I can't just keep doing my college jobs and not making money. Um, <laughs> and then I had a friend who told me, hey, you should look online. There's this thing called youthpastor.com and people post resumes. And I was like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. And that's what I have a degree in. So no joke. I went on youthpastor.com. I don't even know if it's a thing anymore. Right. This is like in 2006 Absolutely. and I saw there was this job close to me. And so I filled out the application and I got interviewed like five times and then I got the job. Wow. And so I don't know, like I wasn't like rebelling against what God wanted me to do. I just definitely didn't want to do youth ministry. And then I had to do it um, because I needed a job. And, and, <laughs> and then God took me to this small, like the, the, the place I started working is, further west than i am currently it's way out on the west side of phoenix it's like the last city before you get to california almost and uh dude it's like cowboy cotton fields like podunk (laughs) nowhere and i worked at a church out there for five and a half years and it was just small and they i built the youth ministry you know and um you have those times where you just feel like you're in obscurity and you're like lord what are you doing but man, it's in those times where he really hones you and trains you and develops your heart for ministry. Because I think about like David, right? He was, he was out with sheep and God was developing him to, to lead people. And yeah. I think about Moses for those 40 years, he's in Midian and he's just, again, um, shepherding sheep and goats and not doing anything with his life compared yeah. to growing up as a prince of Egypt, you know? And so I, I thought about that a lot. And one of the things God taught me during that time was how to deal with um, hardship in ministry and disappointment. Um, because you always feel like, man, what am I doing? There's, you know, 30 kids coming to this thing. Am I even making a difference? You get discouraged. People don't appreciate youth pastors very much typically. <laughs> and yeah. So it's not a prestigious position. Right. And so, man, I just felt like this is, this sucks. Like this is terrible. <laughs> um, and the Lord kept t- telling me and has told me this multiple times is, are you doing this because you love me or are you doing this to be successful? Wow. And that's a gut punch, you know? Gut. Yeah. And I think about that a lot. And like, why am I doing this? Am I doing it for him? Cause I'm serving him or am I doing it to accomplish? Am I doing it to be successful? Am I doing it to look like, Oh, I have it together and I know what I'm doing. Um, and, and if you're, if you're doing ministry, so you'll see successes, you're going to be sorely disappointed and you're not going to stay in ministry very long because <laughs> it's such a nebulous thing. You know, like I used to roof houses when I was in college and I could see the roof accomplished, right? At the end of the day, I'd be like, okay, we did that. I'm in ministry. And I'm like, oh, what did I even do today? You know, I met with <laughs> people and we talked about the Lord and, but what did I accomplish? Yeah. And, um, it's a really tough, it's a really tough job because you can't see the fruits of your work all the time, you know, and it might take years before you see it. And, and maybe that kid will come back and tell you, Hey, that really made an impact on me, you know, but for every one of those, there's a hundred you don't. And so, but, but who am I doing it for? I think about that a lot. Like, why do I do this thing? 
and it's it's for the Lord. It has to be, otherwise you're just going to drive yourself crazy. And if I'm doing it for Him, and I want to serve Him, and I want to be faithful to Him, then this whole thing makes sense. But if I'm doing it to be successful, man, there's way other, there's there's a lot of other easier ways to be successful. Yeah. And uh, to climb the corporate ladder, no matter what you know what kind of a job that is, <laughs> um, but ministry has to be for the Lord, or you're just going to get real discouraged. Exactly, and that's honestly you hit the nail on the head because for me, uh, when I, when when I went, when I made the decision to go to college, uh, I wanted to go to seminary school, but I didn't, um, mainly because I was like, man, pastors don't make money. (laughs) Yeah. Hey, you're right, man. (laughs) Like pastors, they don't make money unless you like can somehow build a mega church and, you know, have all the fame and glory. Um, that's not to put down any mega churches, but, um, <laughs> um, but yeah, sure. No. Yeah. But you yeah, know, I, I understand like, yeah, but it's like, you know, I wanted to, I made the decision to, to go to college for, um, you know, collegiate um, purposes for business and administration, and then went back for um, information systems. And it was like, you know, God, I had a gut punch moment like you, like how God had said, are you doing this for me? Or are you doing this for you? Mm. And honestly, where I'm at now in this season with, with the podcast and with One Faith and everything, you know, it's it's interesting because um, I'm in a similar place where I'm trying to build this thing up. And I'm like, man, I would really love for like, you know, thousands of people to listen to my podcast, to listen to the show, because I really want them to get the word. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, it's like, you know, and you probably seen it too, like when you put your post up or different things like that. You know, you get one or two likes or one or two comments, and it's always the same people or it's your mom, sure. your dad. You know, you know I see. Yeah, thanks, mom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, different ones like that. But at the end of the day, it's like, you know, what did I do? Like, did I just preach to my mom and dad, or you know, am I, you know, really reaching out to different ones? Yeah. But one, one people, one of the um, one a, a person that um, that I'm, I would say I'm in ministry with now. Um, she does the uh, forgiveness movement. Um, within one faith brand um she was telling me she was like you know people they are looking at what you're doing you know they are listening it's just that you know they just keep scrolling <laughs> mm-hmm. they just keep going sure and, and you know and it's it's just the same thing with us like or with you you know with ministry anyone that's listening that's in ministry you know people are paying attention to what you're doing you know yeah. they may not like you know your stuff all the time and they may not you know listen to everything that you're doing but they, they take notice. And a lot of people take notice because they want to see, A, of course, they want to see you fail. B, they want to see, you know, are you consistent with this thing? And then C, of course, they want to see, you know, is your heart truly in this for ministry or is, there, is your heart truly in this for yourself? Yeah. And I know for me, um, my heart is in this for ministry. It is for God. Um, and I believe that's one of the reasons why I believe it. it took me so long to get to this point because for the longest I wanted to just become popular for all the wrong reasons. I wanted, you know, mm-hmm. the fame and glory, like you said, you know, you want to go to Las Vegas and, <laughs> and you know, do magic and, you know, yeah. stop shows and just sleep during the day and, you know, do whatever you want. But, you know, for me, you know, my dream was like, hey, I'm either going to go to the NBA or I'm going to, you know, be this actor, actress, not actress, God, you. <laughs> actor, comedian, <laughs> you know, any, any yeah. person of entertainment is just, you know, I want the fame, I want the glory, I want to be on the team, I want all this. But at the end of the day, it's like, God's like, you know, are you doing this for me? Are you doing it for, for the fame and glory? It's not for the fame and glory. Ministry is not for the fame and glory. It's never for no. the glory. Because, you know, what a lot of people don't understand, and they'll see it like, you know, your big name pastor, like Stephen Curtis. Pastor Long Todd and um, you know Joel Osteen, just the name. Of yeah. You know, you'll see those. You're like, man, those great names. You know, they're, God has really blessed the ministries and different things like that. But you know, they started from the bottom. They started from you know where we are trying to work this thing up. Um, yeah. They started you know with bare minimums, <laughs> well with nothing. Or some of them was just you know Joel Osteen was kind of in the position. Um, his daddy just pretty much gave him the church. But, mm-hmm. but, you know, you know, some people are fortunate like that and some people aren't, you know, some people really have to work for this thing. But yeah, I heard you know, one time too, like there was this lady who, uh, 
She was a missionary in France for like 30 years. And yeah. France is like super atheistic, right? It's like yeah. less than, it's like less than half of 1% would even admit they're Christian and they're mostly Catholic. Mm -hmm. And she was there for 20 some years, 30 some years, and she didn't see anybody convert ever. Mm -hmm. For 30 years of ministry, didn't see one person become a Christian. And I heard somebody say, that is just a failure, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, not if that's what God told her to do. Yeah. Right, like, exactly. like Jer Jeremiah, man, he his. You can look at his ministry as a failure. They yep. didn't listen to him. They didn't turn around, and the the whole city got abducted by the Babylonian Empire. Yep. Um, and so, like, I don't know, man. Like, sometimes I think about what is success, right? And I know what worldly success looks like. It looks like fame and power and money. Mm -hmm. Um, but God's economy is different, and Very faithfulness good. will be rewarded. You know, and and. I think about that a lot, right? I want my podcast to blow up and I want my ministry to be huge and make an impact. And I always say, oh, it's for the Lord. And sometimes I wonder, is it for the Lord? Or is it because I want my ego stroked? I don't know. But faithfulness to, I'll just do whatever you tell me to do, Lord. Even if that means three people listen to my podcast for 40 years, I'll do it if that's what you have for me. Because he's going to reward faithfulness. And I'd rather be faithful to him than have worldly success only to get to stand before him and hear, not well done, not good job, right? I, I want to hear well done, good and faithful servant. And I think that so often we forget, you know, in that parable of the talents where he says, well done, a good, faithful servant. To the one who didn't do well, he called him a wicked, lazy slave. Yes. I don't want to be called a wicked, lazy slave. Me either. I wanna be, <laughs> yeah, I want to be good, faithful servant. So that means... He doesn't say good, successful servant. You notice that. Yeah, he he's does. Faithful. And so how can I be faithful to what he's given me, the time he's given me, the talent he's given me, the treasures he's given me, the influence he's given me? How can I be faithful with what I have uh, to, to, to show him that I'm, I'm focused on serving him, not on building my kingdom, mm -hmm. but on helping him build his? Right. And I think God is looking for more faithful people in this season. To just yeah. do it, you know, he's he's called them to do. Um, yep. I love, um, you know, Pastor Michael Todd. <laughs> and I look at, you know, his rise to glory as something that's like, man, God is really favoring him. But he'll tell you, he'll tell you himself, like, he literally used to do youth ministry, a lot of different things. Um, and would be questioning, like, you know, am I really making an impact? Am I really yeah. doing, you know, what God has called me to do? And like, and with him doing the relationship goal series and that kind of like propelled him into where he's just right now. It's like, man, it's like, wow. Like, you know, God really can bless, but you yeah. know, I had to challenge myself because um, I see that I'm like, man, if he could do it, I can. But at the end of the day, it's like, you know, is that the end goal for ministry? Mm -hmm. Do you just want to blow up so that, you know, people can, you know, be in awe of what you've done. And so you, you can like stunt on other people. Or yeah. is the end goal for you to really make an impact with people? And if, if it's just one person's life, one person that consistently listens to your podcast, if you make an impact in their life, is, does that matter more than the fame and glory? And yeah. to me, I think that makes more of an impact, just being consistent. If I have just one listener, and if you're that one listener and you're consistent with me, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, if you just have one listener, one person that can buy into what you're doing, and consistently stay with you and, you know, just continue to, to rock with you. I think that is more important in ministry than anything. Yeah. I remember when I was, uh, when I, uh, when I left college, when I graduated and, um, well, no, not when I graduated, but when I, um, transferred back home, uh, a young lady that I had ministered to, um, a couple of years back in college, she was telling me, um, that, you know, she was listening to everything that I was saying and everything that I was doing. Um, and she followed my, um, she followed me on Facebook and Instagram. I was you know, paying attention to my posts. And she said that, you know, when she got saved, she was like, you were the one that planted the seed. And I was mm. like, I never knew that. <laughs> because, yeah, awesome. you know, right. It was like, I never knew that. And she was like, you know, you were the one that planted the seed. I would pay attention to what you were doing and you, you know, were the example. And yep. she was like, so many people are looking at you like that. And you have to continue to, you know, be that example. And I just, and I just think about that all the time because, you know, even when I fail or even when I mess up, you know, the blood is on my hands, of course, but, you know, it, it, it puts in perspective that, you know, God is still faithful, one, mm -hmm. God is still just, and he's still loving enough to forgive us for our sins, but at the yep. same time, he's still faithful and just enough to show us that, you know, we are in ministry for a reason. Um, mm -hmm. We are in this thing for a reason because, you know, the numbers may not be there right now. 
they'll get there. You know, mm-hmm. that's 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 the plan. You know, it'll it'll definitely get there. But yeah. you know, what's more important is staying faithful, staying consistent, loving the people who are supporting you now, loving the people who are you know in tune with you now, and just continuing to put out quality content, continue to, to preach the gospel in a good yeah. manner, and you know, continue to lead people the right way and be that example. Because we never know who is looking at us, who is watching us, who is, you know, probably taking notes right now and saying, hey, yeah. you know, I want to be like them and do this, that, and third. It's like, sure. that much. <laughs> but, you know, it's a lot of people that just needs that that push for mm-hmm. them to do it. And so. Well, and, and I even think about, like, Jesus, his own ministry, you know, like, when he started, man, he was healing people and he was giving out free food. Mm-hmm. Like, he had a huge following, right? Like, that was awesome. And he had 90 disciples who were following him around. Like, that sounds cool. Yeah. But the more faithful he was, and as he continued to be faithful to what God called him to do, his popularity dwindled. Yeah. He, like, went in reverse, right? He was yeah. really popular at first, and then he started saying hard things. And then even his own 11 faithful disciples all abandoned him. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. He never wrote a book. He never was in a movie. Jesus didn't have a podcast. Like, you know, you think about all this stuff and it's like, man, what did that guy do? Well, he changed the world. Changed, literally. He changed the world because he was faithful to what the father told him to do. Um, And so, yeah, faithfulness over success, right? His, His kingdom come, his will be done. I mean, these are things Jesus told us, right? It's kind of, it's just, it's Christianity 101, yep. but it is profound to live that way and to be okay with him being in charge of the results, right? Mm-hmm. I'm faithful and I do what I can and I'm not lazy and I work hard, but the results are up to the Lord. And am I okay with that? Mm-hmm. Or do I want to manufacture worldly success so I can feel better about myself? Mm-hmm. I don't know if I want to do that. Yeah, I don't either because that I mean, that could get you a ticket to hell. <laughs> yeah, that can get you in big trouble. Put that, yeah, if you put that more, um, if you ah, place that having more precedence over God. Sorry, I told you yeah, I had a hard time um, getting to and all that. Good <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, we kind of covered a lot of these questions, like what motivated yeah. you to see ministry. Um, so, even like, and this is one of the questions that I really wanted to highlight uh, in this season that we're in with the pandemic. Um, everyone is, you know, at home now and, and doing ministry in a different way, in a unique way. Um, how has, you know, ministry been different for you in this season and what mm-hmm. continues to motivate you to continue in ministry, even in this season? Yeah. So ministry has been really different, obviously, because we had to do a whole bunch of stuff online, which I hate because I'm an extrovert. And so like, yeah video you know the introverts that i work with are like this is great like i don't have to talk to people i just videotape my stuff and i'm like this is driving me nuts like i want to be with people i want to talk with people so that's been really hard like it's almost like we've all been forced to be lepers you know and and be removed from our community and it bugs me so that's been really hard for me and just allowing the lord to work on my patience with that and hey it's okay not to see people all the time and i know that's a need you have but you know, loving people enough to be quarantined for a while, all of that has been a good lesson on patience. Um, but it's, it's been hard. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that keeps me like motivated for ministry and to keep going is um, this passage out of uh, Philippians 3, 10 through 12. I love these verses. Can I, is it cool if I read them? Yeah, read it. Read ahead. All right. Philippians 3, 10 through 12. Paul says uh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. And I've thought about that first sentence. He says that I may know him Hmm. and man, that's the goal. I want to know Jesus more and I want to know him uh, in a, in a personal relationship way, but I also want to be able to relate with him through what he went through in this life. Mm. And if, if coronavirus quarantine can help me know Jesus more, right. And can help me know more about his suffering uh, and his longing to be with his people, but then rejecting him and not wanting to be in his presence. Right. Right. If that can help me understand him more, then it's a good thing. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I just, I think about that all the time. That I want to know him. And so whatever that looks like in whatever situation in life, whether that's knowing him through the hard times, right? Knowing him through the good times, uh, however I can know him more, uh, I want that. And so I think that this whole situation we've been in for the last few months has been a big part of that. Yeah. Um, I think even, you know, with, with the racial tensions and problems and then the George Floyd stuff and all of, all of this horrific stuff that's happened in our country. Um, I'm not happy about it at all. Uh, and I want change and I want real reconciliation and, and repentance and forgiveness and, and all of that that comes with the gospel. But if it can help me to know Jesus pain more and help me to know his heart for people more, mm. then, then uh, as much as I hate going through it, uh, I, I, I'm okay going through it. Yeah. Um, and so I, th- I think about that a lot, that it has to motivate me to focus on what's really valuable and important. And I think about Jesus, you know, it, I love in Hebrews where it says he can empathize with our every weakness, right? Yes. And you think about, you know, I'm like, how was, how was he racially profiled? And then I remember, man, remember he moved to Egypt for three years as a little kid, right? Yeah. He was. I mean, he was. Mm-hmm. Um, but then he was also on the uh, racially... Um, majority side when he was in in, in yeah. israel right yeah. and so that's fascinating too i yeah. mean he literally can relate with us wherever we're at and whatever we've experienced because he went through it when he was here on earth he yeah. was raised by a single mom right joseph probably died really early on i mean you you think about all the stuff he went through and he really can empathize with us wherever we're at and so i want to know that guy yeah. And I want to know how he got through it. And I want to know where his, his motivation and power came from. Mm-hmm. And he says that that resurrection power resides in us as his believers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so to know him, man, that's my motivation. And whatever situation comes up, I can use it to know him more. I love that. Because that's, yeah. honestly, that's what I've been preaching since this whole pandemic has started. You know, God has placed us in a unique um, season to where he has forced us to really you know, go home, read our Bibles, <laughs> mm-hmm. pray yeah. with him more, and just believe in him more. And it's not that he's punishing us for anything or anything like that. I don't think so. Yep. But I think that it's a unique season. We don't know what's coming next. And maybe God yeah. is using the season to prepare us for what's coming next or to get us ready for, you know, whatever is whatever is lying ahead that will that will force us, or force is just like such a wrong word, but, but that will require us to use, you know, all of our biblical teachings and knowledge yeah. and, and prayer and, and wisdom that we've gained from him in this next season, because we don't know what's coming. And I, no. I have said that too many times, but we don't know what's coming, but I feel like this is a unique season for that. You know, I believe that there is going to be a great revival that will take place when all this does when, um, when the pandemic lifts and we're mm-hmm. back, to, back to somewhat of normal. I don't think we'll ever be back to normal, but yeah. we're back to, you know, some sense of normalcy, you know. I believe that there's going to be a great spirit of revival across the land and people just have to really be ready, um, especially us as, uh, as preachers in ministry and also um, people that are just lay members that, you know, that just read, love the Lord, read their Bibles, you know. Mm-hmm. I've, I've always said that I believe that every Christian is like a mini minister because when you come to know Christ, you know, you have to be accountable for the things that you know and you yep. have to stand for what you know and believe in what you mean and stand for what you stand for what you believe in. And not only do you have to do that, but you know, you always have to, you know, make the case for why you believe for what you believe. That's that's Bible. That's what Paul taught us to do. And yep. you have to consistently do that over time, over time, because you don't know who we're gonna come in contact with. You know, we may come in contact with people, we may be the only Jesus that they'll see. And if yep. they're misrepresenting Jesus in a wrong light, then that can really, you know, leave a bad taste of Christianity in people's mouths um, mm-hmm. that, you know, unfortunately we <laughs> would have to deal with and try to root out. But, you know, I think that this season is very, very um, interesting. Um, I've, I've used this season to, you know, of course, launch more faith and the, the, the podcast and everything. Yeah. But I've used this season to really seek after God more. Because I believe that he is requiring more of us, more from us. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's requiring us to dig deeper, to go deeper, to study longer, to pray longer, um, to become better equipped in our our gifts and talents that he has given us. 
Mm -hmm. uh, because I feel like it's going to be, we're going to be using it a lot more in the next season. Um, not just because, you know, they're going to be, you know, <laughs> demons down here that we have to cast out and everything like that. But I mean, I don't know, but <laughs> You yeah, know. who knows, man? Like yeah, the way knows? she's gone, maybe, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, right. Let me not speak for God, but <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you know, He's requiring us to 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 draw close, to to get close, to um, embody more of Him, to to gain more of His presence. And I believe mm -hmm. that is more um, present in anything in this day and age. You know, I I made this comment a while back. Like, you know, it's so funny because people are now forced to go home. They're forced. They're forced to stay at home. And because they're forced to stay at home, they're forced to, you know, either listen to church through their tablets, iPhones, or even their TVs if they have a smart TV. Mm -hmm. And now the word goes out throughout their home. And we don't know what people do when they leave church and go home. You know, maybe people leave church at church and come home. It's a different, totally different environment. But now yeah. God is really, you know, using this season to really clean up a lot of houses. He's, he's using the season to um, get some things in order so that people can, you know, be ready. We don't know when Jesus is coming. You know, he could come anytime, any, any yep. day. But there are signs that, you know, point to the, um, like you said earlier, there are signs that point to the end times, uh, the eschatological events that will take place. Mm -hmm. um, we're, you know, we're close to that stuff. I believe that we are definitely um, in, in the getting close to it. But I don't think that, like you said, I don't, I don't really think that we'll see it in, this, in our lifetime unless we yeah. um, somehow got grants us the um <laughs> the um the health and um, wisdom of uh, Moses and those in the back sure <laughs> those yeah who knows for hundreds and hundreds of years <laughs> <laughs> I don't see that ever happening <laughs> yeah so all right um yeah we're wrapping up on uh, we're, we've been talking for an hour over an hour it's been a great <laughs> conversation man. I really yeah enjoyed I've enjoyed it. it too man um so I will leave us with this question um which is uh, kind of, I kind of want to ask two questions. You mind if I ask two questions? You have yeah, time? that's fine. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. So have you ever wanted to quit ministry? If so, why? Yeah, of course. Um, I never wanted to quit Jesus, mm -hmm. but I've wanted to quit working at a church mm -hmm. um, because people are jerks, man. Like Christians are, they're the worst. Like <clears throat> that sounds it. horrible, but it's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's true. Like, man, people think because you're a pastor, you're their slave. Wow. And I've thought about this a lot. And I heard a really great quote one time. And, and this helps me to keep things in perspective. And there was this pastor and he said, um, when it comes to our congregation, we are their servant, but they're not our master. Mm. And we have to keep that in perspective. We are their servant, but they're not our master. And so, yeah, there's been times I've wanted to quit, man. People treat you terrible. People get mad about things and think that you should bend over backwards to fix their kid and their problems. And you did this one little thing or you said one little thing off. And, you know, I did a, we had a podcast, uh, oh, it was like three, four weeks ago now, but I had a couple of uh, African-American pastors I know come on the show. Mm -hmm. And then my other friend who, who's a pastor now, but he was a former skinhead in high school. Wow. Um, and so, and we talked about racial reconciliation and George Floyd and all that. And um, uh, it was good. It was a good, you know, it was a good conversation. Mm -hmm. And man, I had so many people that were saying, this is great. Best episode ever. Then I had a whole bunch of people on the other side saying, you must hate police. And you think that looting is fine. And I'm like, what are you talking about? We didn't even discuss. <laughs> and it's just, it's amazing, man, how people, when you're in ministry, they don't mind voicing their opinions and telling you that you're completely wrong. And it's usually people who have no clue about what the Bible says. Right. So there's been times I've wrestled with the Lord and told him that his sheep are really smelly jerks <laughs> and that I'm tired of them. Yeah. Uh, but again, it always goes back to, he says, are you doing this because you're seeing success? Or are you doing it for me? Mm. Um, and so as much as I've wanted to quit ministry, right? I can't because number one, what, where else am I going to go? And what am I going to do that has more meaning, right? Right. And not that you can't be working a regular job and be an awesome witness for the Lord. Of course you can. Like, there's so many people that are like that. Yeah. Um, but I think for what God's called me to do, like, ministry, full-time ministry is, is what he's called me to now. And I want to be faithful to that despite and in spite of people who, who are going to try to make me quit 
with their bad attitudes. And usually it's not non-Christians, man. Usually it's Christians. Yeah. And that's the bummer of it. But I always think about Jesus and his biggest opposition was the religious people too, you know? Yep. Those were the people that were meanest to him that literally killed him. Yep. And so if I want to be like Jesus, I have to be able to go through those kinds of things too. Yeah. So yeah, I've wanted to quit. Um, and there's been a million situations as to why, um, but God can help me get through it. And if I, if I focus on knowing him and experiencing what he experienced, it really helps. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it's funny that you say that because it's like, I, me and my wife, we, we have been on this journey, um, with just learning people, um, church people in, in mm-hmm. and of itself and just seeing their true colors. Um, one of the interesting things about this season, which is, which is so weird. It's like, it's like God is exposing the truthness about people. Oh, like, yeah. I've seen so many, oh, my gosh, I've seen the side of people that I didn't want to see, especially from people <laughs> that I've respected and, and loved for years. It's like, mm-hmm. God, I love these people. And at the same time, it's like God has shown that these people are really, like you said, just smelly sheep. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Really suck. But at the same time, it's like, you know, you have to still love them in spite of it. Yep. And that's the biggest thing. And I did a, a podcast um, about racial reconciliation where I talked about the, um, the sin of partiality. And oh, yeah. how we basically have to, in spite of how crazy people are and how bad they are, and we may not agree with them, but we still have to love them. You know, we can't yeah. turn partial towards them because, you know, it's not, it's not God-like. And, and it's going to, I hate to say it's going to be one of those things to keep us, out, keep us out of heaven, but it can if we do not keep it, if we do not put it in check or put it in perspective. Because mm-hmm. if we favor more, if we, pay, if we favor people who tend to agree with us more, who look like us and, and, and act like us more versus those who don't, then how are we really reaching those people who don't look like us, who don't yeah. talk like us, and that are basically just flat out, you know, more worse than sin than we are. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, we can't, you know, if we're constantly in this bubble of being perfect, in this bubble of being um, who we are and we just think that we're great and nobody and everybody else just isn't, you know, mm-hmm. there's no real true growth that comes out of that. Um, and that's one of the things that I've learned in the season. And it's funny you said that you, you, you uh, thought about quitting. I've thought about quitting many times. I've, <laughs> I've been ordained for um, going on, I think this is my third year. And it's funny because like after, after the first year, it's like, you know what, I laid this whole title down. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah. is not what I thought it would be you know I didn't think that it was going to be all you know fame and glory and, and things like that I could care less about the title um but you know I thought that it was going to come with more um responsibility and more access to great things but at the same time it was just like I was involved in situations where it's like god I had nothing to do with that yeah. <laughs> and like and I was just falsely accused of stuff and I'm like I don't understand that and a lot of that situation and then, you know, just the run-ins that I've had with different ones and different things like that. It's just like, you know what, God, if this is what it's like to be an elder, I don't want to be an elder. I would just rather be called a minister, <laughs> a yeah. regular person, yeah. just loves the Lord and just shares the gospel and just not responsible for people. But at the end of the day, I feel like God is really showing me, you know, that side because when we grow in ministry, when we grow as, as just any person in general, you know, we're going to have to learn how to deal with different people and their mm-hmm. attitudes, their egos, their, their personalities. And we have to learn how to navigate through that. As you yeah. said, you know, navigating and learning how to navigate through that, it helps us to understand and love Christ more for who he is and for mm-hmm. what he is and for what he can give us in return. You know, we may want people to change, um, in that season or in that moment, but honestly, God can be changing us and saying, hey, I want you to soften your heart even more yeah. so that you can, you know, love this person even more, no matter how crazy they are. And yeah. that's just what it's all about in ministry, you know, and doing things for God and not for us. So Yeah, that's totally true, man. If, if I ever meet a pastor who tells me he hasn't thought about quitting, I'll just call him a liar to his face. Right. It's like, <laughs> of course you have. You All of us have, because it's a tough job. But the other thing too is like, you were saying like it can develop us to be more like Jesus because we're dealing with tough people. And I've, I heard a guy say this one time. He said that in ministry, you have to develop tough skin. So you don't develop a hard heart. 
Because if you don't have tough skin, your heart's going to just harden. You're going to hate people. Right. Um, but if you can have tough skin and you can love people, I, I always think it's funny. Jesus tells us to love our neighbors, not love your friends. Because mm-hmm. friends and neighbors aren't necessarily the same thing at all. They aren't. And so, yeah, loving your neighbor, loving the people that are around you, loving that annoying person at church that's always, you know, ragging on you or sending you an email about how you didn't get the theological context completely right in your last sermon. <laughs> just like, all right, man, like, how can, how would Jesus love this person, right? How can I love this person? And what can I learn, right? What can I learn from it as I go forward? So it's a good perspective. It is. It is. It's, it's funny. And I, it's a quick story. I, I remember um, I did um, campus ministry. Um, it's part of my story, but I was actually uh, one of the campus ministers um, at NC State last year. Mm-hmm. And it was funny. That I led the students on a fast because I was saying, hey, I believe that God is one. Uh, God just spoke to me and said, hey, in the middle of one of my sermons that I was preaching, was like, hey, you know, God just dropped them in the students fast um, so that we can, you know, believe God to grow this ministry, believe God to change us. And, you know, if we give up something that is um, hard but necessary uh, and, you know, in turn, you know, focus that thing that we desired more, that desire towards God, you know, God mm-hmm. can, you know, replace that desire for those things for more of his presence. And that's the whole, that was the whole thing. It was like, that was the whole fast was about turn. Yeah. It wasn't about turn. If you wanted to turn down your plate, you turn down your plate. But, you know, it was more of abstaining from, you know, if social media is your corruption, social media mm-hmm. is your downfall. If you are on Facebook 24, 23 hours a day, yeah. and, you know, one hour is just for sleep, then, you know, hey, you need to reevaluate some things. But, you know, it was for that type of situation because college students, you know, they're always on social media, they're always on YouTube. They're always oh, yeah. You know, they're not really in tune with the Bible. And so they're not, you tell them to fast, they're like, mm, no, nah, I, don't, I don't get with that. But, you know, you have to be creative. <laughs> yeah, sure. And you have to think about, you know, you know, trying to appeal to a college student. So that's that's what it was all about. And one of the elders of the church came to me because he because his daughter goes to the um, she went to the Bible study and she went home and was excited about the fast. It was like, yeah, they were fasting and I'm letting go of this, that third, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, hold on, hold on, hold on. I was like, you know, fasting is really about uh, turning down your plate. He was like, how come he didn't teach that? And he pulled me aside and started going off about that. And I'm like, bro, are you serious? Mm-hmm. <laughs> You just missed the whole point because yeah. you want to be biblically or technically correct. But, you know, in the moment, you know, when God kind of downloads something into you, and you, you probably experience it when you're preaching, you know, God gives you mm-hmm. something um, in, the, in the moment and yeah. you just go with it and you just do it because God is telling you to do it. You have to be, you know, obedient to it. Yeah. And, you know, and you want the kids to buy into it too, because, you know, you're excited about it. They have to be excited about it. And so, you know, you dive into it and the guy, he just totally missed it. He was like, you know, it's amazing what these kids will, will listen to these things. I'm like, yeah. are you just okay, judging because she's not listening to you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're always going to have those guys, man, who know better and they'll come in, you know? Yeah. You just, it doesn't matter how old you get. It doesn't matter how much okay. ministry you've done. It doesn't matter because there's always those guys out there. <laughs> just always going to do it so yeah. all right last question and i'll let you go man it's been a great conversation um so how can someone um or how can your why i uh, sorry how can your why inspire someone else to find their why and how can someone find their purpose in god and in life yeah well i think that if our goal is to know jesus and to know that christianity is true right and to seek him with our whole heart Uh, I think that that can be all of our why, like no matter what situation we've come from, no matter what part of the country we live in, no matter what background we had with church or Mm -hmm. not with church. um, I think that one of the things that I think is really important for us all to understand is that, you know, in this, in this whole story of, of Christianity and existence, like none of us are the heroes, right? Like I'm not the LeBron James on the floor and we all want to be, we all want to be the guy. Mm-hmm. But Jesus is the guy. Exactly. Um, the best we can be is good role players. Mm. And that's it. That's it. And so, so instead, of, instead of raging against the fact that I'm not the hero of the story, but, but humbly accepting that, man, I'm, I'm allowed to play a role in the most significant quest in the history of the universe. Mm-hmm. I want to play my role well, no matter what it is. 
whatever he gives me. If, if the Lord tells me you got to be a librarian at this little, you know, library in the middle of rural Arizona, mm-hmm. man, I need to do that to the best of my ability. And I need to point people to him. Right. If he wants me to be a mega church pastor in Oklahoma, okay, then this is what you're going to do. If he wants me to be an apologetics podcaster in Arizona, whatever it is, right? Like I am privileged to play whatever role he's given me because I'm, I'm completely replaceable. He's not replaceable, but all of us are replaceable and expendable. And so I think no matter where we're at, all of us can play the role he's given us and all of us can be faithful. I think that's the key, man. It's not success. It's faithfulness. Mm. How can I be faithful with the role he's given me and with the torch of Christianity that we have, right? Carrying that in this point in church history, in our context here in America, what can I do to be faithful and to hand off the torch to the next generation? Well, leaving them Christianity at a place that's, that's okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that's what I think all of our why needs to be is what, what's the role that God's called me to do. And it's so hard because we always want to look at the other guy and compare ourselves with their success. Mm-hmm. And God doesn't, doesn't look at it like that. He says, I don't care about them. What I tell you to do, right? I mean, remember when he tells Peter that? Yep. Peter says, what about John? Like, how's he going to die? He says, who cares? <laughs> this is what I'm telling you. Mm-hmm. And I, I think about that a lot. Like, so what has God called me to do? Uh, where I'm at? How can I bloom where I'm planted? And uh, I think all of us can do that. that. That is our why, to play a role in the most significant uh, mission in the history of mankind and that's to point people to jesus christ that's beautiful that's beautiful and we'll end on that because that's that's mic drop <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> mic drop so um how can people find you and connect with you um and your ministry yeah so if people want to check out our church it's desert springs community church uh, they can go to dscchurch.com uh, also, our podcast is Christ, Culture, and Coffee, and we're on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, everywhere. Um, and then we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all the places, Christ, Culture, and Coffee. If you just look it up, you can find it.